Well, praise the Lord, saints. Uh, this morning we continue uh, our fellowship from yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> for the sake of those who could not be with us uh, yesterday, we, in the first two messages, <clears throat> we covered this matter of uh, the vision of the priesthood as seen in the whole Bible. That uh, the priesthood, actually the, the Bible is a book on the priesthood. From <clears throat> the Bible, uh, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you see the, uh, this matter of the priesthood mentioned again and again. Uh, in Genesis, uh, although uh, there were not too many uh, mentions of the, the, the word priest or priesthood, except in Genesis 14, where it was first mentioned with uh, Melchizedek. And uh, there were different individuals, uh, such as uh, 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 Abel, uh, Noah, uh, Abraham, and they all offered sacrifice to God, which the priests were doing. So without anything official, they were functioning as priests, offering sacrifice to God. But those, are, uh, those were individuals uh, by different persons. It's not until uh, we come to the book of Exodus that after God had gained a group of people, a nation, the children of Israel, that he brought them out of Egypt and then through the wilderness and to Mount Sinai. And <clears throat> they were formed together as a nation and God gave them the law, the commandments. And along with that, uh, God says that you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. So it is here in Exodus that God revealed his heart's desire in a more fuller and a complete way. Uh, not only individual persons here and there offering sacrifices, as priests, but now God is gaining a people uh, whom he can call a kingdom of priests, serving him. And, and along with that is the uh, setting up of the tabernacle, right? And all the furnishing. And then, you know, the rest of the Old Testament, that's what it's all about, is about the tabernacle and later on the temple and wherever the tabernacle or the temple was, there was also always the priest serving. So uh, that's the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, uh, the beginning of the New Testament was by the coming of John the Baptist. He was a priest. He was a son of a priest. And he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And he ushered in. Uh, the God-man, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> to be our Savior, to carry out the redemption. Uh, and, of course, he was the real priest, Jesus Christ, even the high priest. He offered the unique sacrifice, the sin offering for us. And, and then uh, uh, when you reach to the end uh, of the Bible in Revelation, we are told that, that God has redeemed us, has washed us with his blood, redeemed, saved us from all peoples, tongues, and nations, that we would be made a kingdom, priest to our God. So, dear brothers and sisters, this matter of the priesthood is huge. I mean, this, is, uh, this embraces the entire economy of God. Um, <clears throat> we, the subject for this conference is uh, for us to see this New Testament priesthood to, for the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. In order for God to fulfill his eternal purpose, to have his desire satisfied, there has to be the priesthood. And this priest, priest or the priesthood, is not at all 
what we uh, uh, had in mind in our concept according to all the uh, religious thoughts that we had, uh, a certain style of clothing, a certain type of activities, uh, ceremonies, you know, to involving uh, offering, uh, conducting ceremonies and so forth. Those are all together, sorry to say, is a result of the fallen degraded Christianity, bringing in all these uh, degraded thoughts about the priest. But in God's thought, a priest, even before he created man, that with <clears throat> that uh, archangel, who later on fall, fell to become Satan, he was actually such a priest, such a king. He was very close to God, indicating that even before the creation of man, this thought of having the priest and also the king was already in God's heart. But Satan, due to his pride and his ambition, he rebelled against God. So when God came to restore the uh, fallen universe, to recreate, uh, to recreate this uh, universe, he came to make man. And he made man in his own image, according to his own likeness, and gave them uh, authority, dominion, to rule over all the other creatures. He made man with that intention to make a priest. He wants man to be a priest, just like Satan, before he fell, he was an archangel, very close to God, but yet he fell. <clears throat> he became God's uh, adversary. But God's desire for priests has never changed, that he desires to gain us to be the priests who are also the kings. The priests and the kings, these two matters, uh, they go together. You cannot have the proper kingship according to God's economy, without being a priest. And so <clears throat> these two matters, these two statuses, kingship and priesthood, always go together. Then, <clears throat> so the whole Bible uh, under this view uh, shows us, reveals to us uh, the centrality, even the universality of this matter of the priesthood, right? We have, God must gain the priesthood. And last night, we saw the definition of a priest is one, the priest is one who is filled with God, saturated with God, permeated with God, flowing out with God. This is what a real priest is. He is the most normal, most proper person. He is not weird in any way. He is not, you know, uh, 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 strange in any way. He is the most normal, most proper person. He is a God man. He is one who lives the most normal, proper human life, yet fully mingled with God, living God out through his humanity. <clears throat> so as a priest, he must be one who is filled with God to the uttermost, to be saturated, permeated with him in every way. And this such a priesthood uh, is shown to us in the, uh, in the Bible uh, uh, that it has two orders. One is the order of Aaron, according to Aaron, which is to take care of man's need, to take care of us uh, uh, related to our sins and our failures. Their sacrifices need to be offered so that man can be brought back to God. Then there is another order, which was actually the main, the primary order, is the order according to Melchizedek, is the order of the priesthood that comes from God to minister uh, <clears throat> the process God into uh, the chosen people as bread and wine. This was seen in... Uh, uh, Melchizedek in Genesis 14. This was God's original purpose in relation to the priesthood. But it's because of the fall, there has to be the ironic priesthood to be brought in to take care of man's failures 
and problems so that we can be restored back to God. So after seeing this, how crucial and how central this matter of the priesthood is, and even to see what a priest, what a priest really is and what, what a priest does, <clears throat> this morning we come to a most uh, experiential uh, aspect of related to the priest, the experience of a priest. What do, uh, what does the priest, what does a priest do? We know what a priest, what a press, priest it should be. He is one to be, should be filled with God, saturated with God, permeated with God. But how can you do this? Well, <clears throat> in this message, we want to come to see uh, all the the various experiences related to the priesthood. And I think in, may, in many of the, uh, of the uh, uh, aspects uh, of this uh, experience, you may be, I think many may be uh, somewhat familiar, but I can also guarantee you there are also many, many aspects you have no idea. You have no idea, and especially in your experience, um, how to enter into the depths of these things. Um, <clears throat> as a priest, the environment of their service was what? Was, a, was the tabernacle, right? Was in the Old Testament, at first with the tabernacle and later on with the temple. And, <clears throat> and they were there to handle, firstly, all the offerings, right? You see all the aspects of the offerings from the sin offering all the way to the burnt, to the burnt offering. And they were to also enter into the tabernacle itself, the sanctuary, comprised of the two sections, the holy place and the holy of holies, to uh, contact, to take care of the various furnishing uh, set up there. And uh, every day, that's what they do. And then once a year, the high priest has to also go into the holy of holies, <clears throat> where the ark of the testimony was, and uh, also where the cherubim of glory was, uh, uh, was behold, uh, uh, looking down, looking on. And, uh, and there the priest, the high priest came in to minister to God. And it was there upon the ark of the testimony, which is called the, whole, the, the mercy seat, uh, which is called the, the throne of grace. That's the spot. Up, uh, above the ark of the testimony, there was a lid called the propitiation cover, mentioned by by Paul in uh, in Romans. And <clears throat> that uh, it is there, God says, I will speak with you. Is there I will meet with you, dear saints? What grace that is! There is a spot where we can go to, where God can meet with us where God can speak to us. That is the spot of the throne of grace, the mercy seat, where it was sprinkled with the blood. It's a very, very rich experience, and this is the privilege of a priest. Only the priest can do this. Only the priest can, get, can be involved with this experience. And don't, don't forget, <clears throat> as we, uh, I wanted you to read Exodus 25, you know, those two verses show us the whole layout, the whole layout of the altar and all the uh, furnishing and, and all the, 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 uh, 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 the setup of the tabernacle. Every bit of it, every inch of it was designed by God. It was God's design. It was not up to Moses' ingenuity. What he, what he thinks should be, uh, how should it be, uh, arrange a, a sanctuary for God. God gave no permission, allowance for Moses with his idea. He, he designed every bit of it. And he ordered every, every part, every uh, 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 action to be taken. The offering of the sacrifices, what sacrifices, how to offer God has laid us out completely. It's not up to you or me to decide how I should, I, how I should come to God. Whenever I thought about this, I just 
bow and worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your wisdom that there is such a thing called the tabernacle, that there is such a thing called the bronze altar, that, that all the priests, every day, they have to go there. They have to handle all the sacrifices. They have to handle all the furnishing in the tabernacle. And you have to realize all these, the altar, the sacri- offerings, the sacrifices, and all the aspects of the furniture, furnishing in the tabernacle, they are all pictures and types of Christ. This whole thing is a type of Christ. Oh, this is not just some, some uh, a diagram or just some, uh, 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 just some kind of uh, um, uh, structure of, or, 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 or layout that God wants people to just uh, uh, follow some instructions. All God has designed all these aspects of the tabernacle to point to Christ. Christ is the real offering. Christ is the, my real burnt offering, my real sin offering. Christ is the real tabernacle. He is the real bread of the presence. He is the real lamp, the light of life. Christ is the real golden incense altar. He is the praying Christ. He is the ark of the covenant. Oh, dear saints, I, I don't know where we will be without the ministry of the age to open these matters up to us. We would just be studying, you know, just uh, these, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, how to just interpret, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, apply some spiritual meaning to it. But you have to see all these aspects of the tabernacle with the content. They are, they are types of this all-inclusive Christ. And as a priest, you are privileged. We are privileged to handle this. The commoners, the people, no, they have no share. They're not allowed to touch these things. But you and I, in the New Testament, there's no more commoners, no more, no more so-called the, 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 the spiritual class. Now in the New Testament, we all are believers. As I mentioned, that uh, even but with Martin Luther, for one to be justified by faith implies that everyone is a priest. Amen. He spoke universal priesthood. That's what it means to be justified by faith, implying that there's no more two classes. No more the, 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 the spiritual class and the common class. We all are priests. And as we all are priests, we, have, we can be involved. We can have a share in all these aspects of the tabernacle, which are all types of Christ. Oh, every day we can handle Christ. We can enjoy Christ. There's no excuse for us to say, oh, today I'm just, uh, 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 I, I, I just cannot touch Christ because, uh, you know, I'm just get too, in, I'm too involved, too busy with my work and then too, in, my, in my things and, uh, and uh, uh, I need to, ha- I'm not, I don't have the, the time to prepare myself to, uh, uh, to come to uh, pray or to meet. Saints, as a priest, you are privileged and you are positioned to enjoy and experience all these aspects of Christ. You have no excuse. I have no excuse. No matter how busy I am, I can en- enjoy him as my meal offering by just calling on him, Lord Jesus. Oh, I'm busy studying, but I need, to, I need you as my supply. right? You are my meal offering. And even as I had a failure, I lost my temper to my children, to my, to, my, to my spouse. Lord, I take you as my sin offering. You don't need to go to the room to bow, to kneel down, you know, to have a special confession session. No, you are right there where you were, where you were just uh, lost your temper the moment, but inwardly you repented. You turned to the Lord and you take him as your sin offering, as your trespass offering. You are, you can, you, we can be experiencing Christ wherever we are. If you will see God's provision is so, so comprehensive, so complete, leaving no, leaving no place for us to even have to worry, to think about what I should do, what I have to do. God has laid out this whole thing to us. The experience of the priest 
that's the, uh, uh, the title, subject of this message, the experiences of the priest, simply speaking, is Christ. It's to experience Christ, but not just in a kind of a general objective way, but in a very detailed, very specific way. Christ as the content of the tabernacle. And this is what the priests, they handle uh, every day. Now, let me go get into the outline. It's, it's a very full, um, many rich content here. First, the first point, the priests experience Christ as the offerings. The Bible reveals to us there are five major offerings. The sin offering, trespass offering, peace offering, meal offering, and burnt offering. These are the five main offerings, supplemented by two or three offerings. You have the wave offering, the heave offering, and also a drink offering. These are the offerings revealed, presented to us from in the book of Leviticus. Again, we don't forget, the, all these offerings refer to Christ. He is the reality of all these offerings. So as a priest, we are privileged to handle offerings. That means we are privileged to handle this Christ, to experience him. A says all the offerings typify the different aspects of what Christ is to us. The priesthood must take care of these offerings. Thus, to partake of the priesthood today means that we must experience Christ as all the offerings. Only when we have experienced Christ as these offerings can we minister them to others. We call these offerings instead of sacrifices because the word offering also means is our present, is a, is a gift we offer to God. The sacrifices uh, more has a kind of meaning of to, to uh, uh, um, uh, as a kind of uh, recompense, as a kind of, uh, you know, to restitute, make restitution. So because you sin, you have to offer a sacrifice uh, it to, uh, 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 in your stead. But now, not only do we have the problem of sins, which require sacrifices to, to, to address, we also have the need of coming to contact God, to meet God, and here, to meet your friend. Don't you want, need to bring some present with you? You should not go to meet your friend empty-handed, right? Now you are coming to meet the greatest friend, our God. You have to bring some present with you. What is, what is this present you're going to bring? You're going to bring Christ. That is the best, the top present. He is called the offerings. He is called the present. We are presenting Christ to God. So these offerings, uh, you know, sin offering, for instance, is a, uh, uh, you know, to address, to, to address the need of our sins, trespasses, our, tres our trespasses, meaning our wrongdoings, our uh, mistakes, and so forth. But, you know, uh, 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 such as uh, a, uh, 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 the burnt offering, the burnt offering is absolute, absolutely to be burnt, is to be burnt up for God's satisfaction. It's the best present we can bring to God, which refers to the Christ who is spotless, blameless, absolute, perfect, in whom is the Father's delight. And we are charged to offer such burnt offering morning and evening. This is our present. This is not just our sacrifice. This is our present we bring to God for fellowship. So all the offerings typify the different aspects of what Christ is to us. And B says, we must experience Christ as the trespass offerings, as a trespass offering, realizing that Christ on the cross 
bore all our trespasses before God. Trespasses are what? They refer to our wrongdoings, our transgressions, our mistakes, our failures. This is what we call the sins in, plur in plurality, plural. These are the sinful deeds that we commit every day. You know, you're losing your temper and uh, uh, your greediness, your, uh, uh, you know, uh, lusting after others' things. Well, these are your sinful deeds, your failures, your mistakes, your wrongdoings. So as we commit these trespasses, uh, you know, there's hardly a day that we have not committed some trespasses. Is there anyone who has no trespasses? If you raise your hand, that's the first trespass that you make. <laughs> you just lied, right? No one is exempt from making some mistakes, no matter how careful you are. But isn't it wonderful? God gave a provision. God made a provision to take care of our trespasses. There is such a thing called the trespass offering. Even a little lie that we, that we, that we told, that we little, little, little uh, 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 misconduct that we committed, trespasses may not be a big deal. You may not have killed somebody, may not have stolen a, robbed a bank, but just a little, little trespasses, God made provision for us. And then, <clears throat> So, so in uh, the, the, these verses, I don't have the time to read all the verses to you, but in 1 John 1, 7 uh, and 9, you still, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive every sin, right? So when you, you know, had, had a little failures um, and uh, had a little misconduct and uh, uh, conduct, have committed some transgression, well, humble yourself and turn to God, confess your sins, and apply his blood, right? And he is your trespass offering. He is faithful, and he is righteous to forgive you. Then point C, we must experience Christ as our sin offering, knowing Christ as the one who died on the cross to deal with, and to, to deal with, our, uh, 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 to deal with, this is a, a, a typo here, to deal with our sinful nature. We commit sins because we have a sinful nature, right? So there is something, even, even if, if that day you have not, you have not uh, lied to anyone, you have not done anything terrible, anything of a uh, transgression, but you are still sin. Sinful nature is still with us. And God has prepared an offering called the sin offering to address who you are as a sinner. Even though you may not have done anything bad, but who you are by your nature is abhorrent to God. You have to offer your sin offering. Jesus Christ is the unique sin offering. He, because he was, he was spotless. He was, sin, he was uh, without blemish. Only he is qualified to be the unique sin offering, to stand in the place of all sinners in the world. Behold the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. Not only did he take away my sins, my sin, take, care, take care of my sinful conduct, he took away sin, the sinful nature. In 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 5, let's see if it, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that's, that's a very a profound verse, which tells us, Him, he who knew no sin, him he made sin on our behalf. He knew no sin, but he must made sin on our behalf. How do you, how do you explain that? He does not even know what sin is. He's this Jesus Christ. But yet in God's eyes, he, became, he was made sin on our behalf. When Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, at least for that, in the first hour, he was judged by men. In the first three hours, and then the second three hours, he was bearing the judgment by God 
as a sinner. He himself who knew no sin, he committed no sin. He does not know what sin is, but in God's eyes, he was counted as sin. He was standing in the place of a sinner on behalf of all of us sinners. He who knew no sin, him he was, he he be, he became who was made sin on our behalf, and then it says what, that we might become God's righteousness in Him. That we may become not just righteous, we become God's righteousness. Wow! When I first read when I first read that verse, I said. I'm not even. I'm not only justified. I become God's righteousness. The matter of sin is taken care of by Jesus Christ, who knew no sin. And then, because of that, God judged him. He took away sin. Now, sin, the sinful the sin, which was a a matter of nature in us, we are born with it. We are born. We are born uh, as descendants of Adam. So every baby is a born a sinful child. Is it with a sinful nature? He has not. The baby has not even started talking yet. There's sin already in him. But Jesus Christ, the sin offering, oh, he became sin on our behalf. He took away sin, and we become that those who take him this sin offering, we become. God's righteousness, God's righteousness. Then he says, after the experience of the trespass offering and the sin offering, we enjoy Christ as the peace offering. Peace always depends upon dealing with all trespasses as well as dealing with our sinful nature. Saints, as believers, to go on with the Lord. We need peace. Without peace, our conscience is always in trouble, in disturbed, and we are not in a proper relationship with God. Here, God takes care of even that very sensitive feeling within us. Christ is our peace offering. He took away our sins and our sin, and He imparts peace to us. This morning we are here, having our Lord's table, eating the bread and the wine, worshiping the Father. We are at peace with God and with men. Here we are no, we have no consciousness of our sins anymore. The Lamb has taken away all our sins. He is our sin offering. He is also our peace offering. Here at the table, it should be every table. There is peace here. God and man has been fully re- the the re- the relationship is fully restored. So here we can freely partake of God and enjoy God, and God can also freely enjoy us. So here, there's no more enmity. There's no more conflict. We are no longer aliens. Uh, alienated from the life of God, we are no longer strangers, no longer enemies of God. We have been brought nigh, brought home to God's house, together with God's family. Here we are just enjoying Him this morning. Then we enjoy Him as we call Father. We love. Thank you for your love toward us, right? And. The the God's love toward us is is just unfathomable, that He loves even us. Who are who are we? Right? What do we have to deserve His love for us? But you know the apostle only can say what love, what love, the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called children of God. And we are. Praise the Lord, and we are. We are not just called children of God; we are children of God. He has begotten us. So Christ is our peace offering. He has established peace 
on the cross, right? In Ephesians 2, he made peace on our behalf. Not only we have peace with God, we have peace with one another, Amen. with all his people. Then <clears throat> uh, E says, no, uh, point F now, uh, uh, no, E, following our experience of Christ as the peace offering, we find that he also is the meal offering, our food and constant satisfaction. Meal offering is, is, uh, is by, you know, with, uh, 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 with uh, vegetables, uh, with uh, 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 bread, with the meal. They are not un it's unrelated to blood, no, nothing to do with blood, nothing to do with animals. So it's not for redemption. The meal is for food. Now, among all these offerings, the meal offering is uniquely an offering for the priest's diet, for the priest to feed on. Many offerings are to be offered up for God, uh, to be burnt up for God's satisfaction. But the meal offering, particularly, is for the, the, the priest to enjoy. You can call this a food offering. God knows that, yes, you're taking care of your sins, you take care of your sin, you know, you have peace, but you are still hungry. Isn't God wise, so wise, to make sure you don't go hungry? He gave you the meal offering to give you food that to, that to eat, just like the, the prodigal son returning, right? Returning to the father, he was clothed with the robe of righteousness, and he was fed with a fattened calf, right? So the father is so wise to consider all our needs. Our needs are not just sins and all the problems, mistakes that we made. We are also hungry. We are short of food. So we have the meal offering, which actually signifies the fine, pure, uh, uh, resurrected, uplifted humanity of Jesus. That fine, perfect humanity of Jesus is our food, is our meal, is our bread for us to feed on. Then we go on, point F, the burnt offering follows the meal offering. Christ is not only our satisfaction, but also God's satisfaction. He is not only our food, he is also God's food. Burnt offering is a fire offering, is an is a, is a offering that is burned up by fire entirely, entirety, nothing left. It's nothing for, for, for the priest to enjoy. It's for God's satisfaction. This burnt offering signifies this Christ who is perfect, who is absolute. He came to the earth as a man to do the Father's will to seek the Father's glory. He, whatever he did, he was absolutely one with the Father. The Father was so pleased with this one that the Father actually declared when the Son was baptized, when he, was, uh, when he rose from the water, he declared, this is my beloved Son. In him is my delight. On the mountain of transfiguration, he spoke the same. This is my delight. The f nothing makes the father so happy as this dear son of his. This dear son who came to do the father's will. In every word he spoke, in everything, every uh, healing, miracle, word that he spoke, he did it in oneness with the father. He was the burnt offering. He gave up his life. He be sacrificed. He was, he was the sinless, dying for the sinful. He was the he was uh, he stood in the place of the uh, uh, the sinners, the transgressors. He was the perfect, absolute one, that satisfied the Father to the uttermost. Every morning, I offer these offerings to my God. Even though sometimes I, think I didn't really listen to anything terrible that day, you know, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I, I didn't think I, I really need to offer my sin offering because I didn't, 
I didn't really didn't do anything terrible. But the Lord always, always remind me about the, uh, the burnt offering. I am in my, in my being, I'm short. You know, I may not have made, have done, have made many mistakes and so forth, but I am in my being. I am not absolute. I am still have spots, have, uh, 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 you know, blemishes. But Jesus Christ was the absolutely perfect one. Absolute one. I lay my hands on him. You know, at the priests, when they offer the sacrifices, they laid their hands on the head of these offerings. And laying of hands means what? Identification. Whatever these, the experiences of these offerings, they become the experience of the priest. So we are, by laying the hands on these ones, we identify with them. Christ's perfection, Christ's absoluteness becomes my perfection, my absoluteness. You know, every morning, I've been doing this for a number of years now. I just come to, every morning, my first place is not to the, is not to the Holy of Holies. My first place is here, is the bronze altar with all the offerings. I love this verse in Psalm 43, verse 4, which says, I go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. Oh, I love that verse. Every morning, I said, Lord, I come to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. This altar, with all these offerings, is, I find joy here. God finds joy here. To God, the God of exceeding joy is here at this altar. We need to come to, dear brothers and sisters, don't try to jump into the Holy of Holies right away. Start from here. Start from this altar with all these offerings. Then let's continue. Point G, we also have to experience Christ as the wave offering and the heave offering, as the resurrected one and also the ascended and transcendent one. The wave offering signifies this living Christ, the resurrected one. He is always like a, a moving, waving in me. He is the living one. Especially when we come together with the saints, we are offering the wave offering. Christ is waving in me. As you're offering up a praise, praise the Lord. Christ is waving in you. He is not dead. He is not silent. He is waving in you. He is more than living. As he says in Revelation, I am living forevermore. He passed through death, but now he is alive and he is now living in us. He is waving in us. Whenever you touch him, he will say, praise me. Oh, declare something. Declare. I am the, I am, uh, Christ has won the victory. Saints, we don't have a dead Christ. We have a waving Christ. <laughs> then we, have a, we are offering the wave offering and also the heave offering. What is the heave offering? Sing, which signifies a, the ascended Christ. He is heaved up to God. He transcends all the depression, transcends all the, all the suppression. He is able to break through and transcend all the earthly realm. Whenever you consider these offerings, don't you worship God? That all your needs, he, has already, he knows, he, he knew, and he has made provision for all your needs. Much, then the next point says, much time is needed to realize and to experience all these offerings, especially by young Christians. When we experience all these offerings in such a way, we will be in a real priesthood. I appreciate the matter of much time. This, you cannot have shortcut here. You need to spend time. When you tell me you have a two minute morning revival, I don't, I won't say I don't believe it, but I just say, I don't think, I don't know what kind of morning revival that you have. You need to spend time. Every morning, 
I spend at least half an hour just to just to go through this, go to the altar, enjoy all these offerings. Christ is the reality of these offerings. He is my replacement. I'm not, I'm only good for death and burial. These offerings point to the Christ who is God's pleasure, who is God's satisfaction. So dear saints, spend some time. Uh, don't just, yeah, you know, now you know all these offerings. You know what they are. You can name them off. But it's not just about your knowledge of them. It's your getting, entering into them, right, to experience them, right, so that to internalize these matters, to become your experience. It doesn't mean that you have to experience every one of these offerings all at once, Right? Maybe in one particular, on one particular day, just one particular aspect touches you more. That's sufficient. Right? But because as priests, this is your life. This is what God has planned for you, what God has ordained for you to do as priests. You are privileged. You are privileged to do, to handle Christ in this way. Then after you pass through, the, the bronze altar, now you are ready to enter the sanctuary. Huh? The sanctuary comprised of the two sections, the holy place and the holy of holies. So to come to point number two, the priest experienced Christ as the bread of the presence. After taking care of the offerings, the priest needed to spread the bread of the presence in the holy place. This means we must experience Christ as our life supply. When we experience Christ as our inner life supply, we will be able to spread him before others and God. When we come to the meeting or contact those in other places, we can present Christ to them as the inner life. We must go deeper with the Lord and not be superficial or outward. Christ is within us, but we must experience him as the indwelling one and the hidden one within who is our life supply. You, as the priest enters the holy, holy place, the first piece of furniture was a table with 12 loaves of bread spread there. These are, these are called the bread of the presence. The, you can you also be called the face bread. It signifies this, these bread are spread in God's presence before God's face. Now, after handling all these offerings, taking care of all our needs and problems, we now can enter into the tabernacle. We saw last night, what is the tabernacle? This is just the incarnated God in Christ, that God became enterable. We are no, we're no longer kept outside. God, we can enter into the tabernacle. Isn't this wonderful? Amen. Then in, as we enter the tabernacle, we have these loaves of bread signifying God wants to be our life and life supply. We come into his presence now. And he, he as the bread, supplies us, nourishes us. Right? And this bread brings us into his presence. As we eat him, we live because of him. As we live, as we eat him, we are brought before his face. We are, we are inwardly strengthened, supplied by him inwardly. Then uh, the, the next point, number three, the priest experienced Christ as the lamp. With the spreading of the bread of the presence in the holy place, the priest must light the lamp. When we have the experience of Christ as the inner life, this life will be the inner lamp shining within us. The life is the, the light of men. Right? In him was life, and this life was the light of men. If you, every time we touch Christ as the inner life, that life always brings light to us. To, bring, to deliver you out of any kind of darkness. After eight hours, ten hours of work, right? In your, at your office or before your computer, you are, you're, you are fully in darkness. <laughs> Sorry to say, you know, we're just, oh, full of uh, 
all the numbers, all the questions, and all the this and that. Uh, when you come home, you are just sorry to you are just in darkness. When your wife saw you, idea, how come your face looks so dark? <laughs> you just uh, you are long faced. You are just uh, you know loaded by with all the problems, and you, you the light just get dimmer and dimmer. Right? And well, you need to be lit up again, right? Lit up again. You now you come to just turning to the Lord, coming to the Word, especially coming to a meeting with the other saints. You know, big meetings, small meetings, just to get together with some saints and join the Lord. The light started shining again. You know, when you are in the when the priests were in the uh, outer court, they were under the sun. Right? They have the natural light out there. But when they enter the tabernacle, there's no, there's no skylight. There's nothing out from the outside. There's a light from the lampstand. That light from the lampstand, what is the lampstand? A golden lampstand signifies God's testimony. It signifies the triune God being testified in Christ. This is not a natural light. Now this is a light from a lampstand, a light shining forth from God, from God's testimony. What is God's testimony? God's testimony is God being expressed, represented. When Jesus Christ came to the earth, he was the testimony of God. When he stood before Pilate, he testified. He said, to this I come to this earth, to bear testimony to the truth, which is God. Jesus was the faithful witness. He was the real testimony. And the church, as his reproduction, as his enlargement, is also the testimony of Jesus. As Jesus was the testimony of God, now the church is the testimony of Christ. And signified by the lampstand. And here in the holy place is a lampstand bearing the light. This light comes from, you may say, comes from the life, which is true experientially. God's life always brings light. But also, I was touched that this light is the light of the lampstand. It's the light from God's testimony. This things in the Lord's recovery under this, this ministry that we, are, that we are in, the ministry of the age, that we, are, we have seen, we have touched what is on God's heart. We have touched God's testimony in this universe. God wants to be expressed in man through mingling himself with us, becoming one with us. This testimony bears the light to lead us, to guide us. We are, no, we are no longer in darkness. We are no longer in blindness. Our eyes have been enlightened to see what is God's eternal purpose, what is God's economy, what is God's testimony he wants to have on this earth. This testimony, this testimony gives me light to walk, to go forward. We are not blind. We are not directionless. We are following the light of God's testimony. And <clears throat> the, uh, uh, have I read point A? Okay. Uh, yes, point A and B now. When we have this experience, we will not just read the Bible by exercising our mind to gain some knowledge, teaching, or doctrine, but something within will be enlightening. This is a deeper item of the priesthood. When we read the Bible, we must not exercise our mentality too much to understand it. If we un understand it too much, it will become the tree of knowledge to us. We must open ourselves to let the Lord fill us, possess us, and occupy us, then the written word will shine within through Christ as the living word, and we will have the inner light, not simply the outward knowledge. Today, we are, as we are going on in the Lord's recovery, we are not 
go moving, going onward by some knowledge we picked up. We picked up a lot of knowledge, sorry to say. Yes, we, you know, you know, through the conferences, training, we have, we have known a lot of things. But yet, knowledge does not help us to go forward. Many times the knowledge may frustrate you, may hinder you. You need the light of life. The light from the bread of life you receive, the light from the lampstand of God's testimony shining. The Lord covers me. I'm, since the time I saw God's economy, God's eternal purpose, my whole life has been guided by this light. There's a light from God's testimony that has been leading me for these last nearly 50 years to walk by this light. And, you know, to take this path, it's not always happy. It's not always splendorous. It's not always uh, glamorous. There are challenges, difficulties, sufferings. But nevertheless, the light is still here. The light from the lampstand guiding us the path to go forward. Our Christian life should not be a life uh, under dimness, under a kind of, uh, uh, with any kind of shadow. You know, I love the Song of Songs, and we read that when the seekers were, you know, experiencing the different stages of her growth in life. She says, until the shadows flee away. Right? Several times she said that. She was in her Christian life, there were shadows. There were just, uh, uh, you know, dimness. But then as she grows, moves on with the Lord, the shadows begin to, to, to fade away. The sh shadow goes away. And eventually she became the moon. She became the heavenly bodies shining. She not only was in the light, she became the light. She became the light. And I hope today, as the, as the Lord's lovers and seekers in his recovery, not only we would walk in the light, we become the light. We must be the light. The light of this dark world. This world is so dark these days. So dark. Full of darkness everywhere. All the things people are saying, are talk, they don't know what they're talking about. They thought this is advancement, this is, uh, this is up to date, this is, uh, this is the fairness. No, you're just in darkness. You need to walk in the light. And the Lord needs his recovery, his people today on the earth to become so enlightened that they become the bearers of light. We, be, we must become the light bearers. Then as you advance forward, the next point, the priests experienced Christ as the incense. The lighting of the lamp and the burning of the incense were taken care of at the same time. These two things can never be separated. If we burn the incense, we must light the lamp, and if we light the lamp, we must burn the incense. This means that to receive light from the word, we must pray by burning the incense. And if we pray by burning the incense, we must light the lamp by reading the word. Reading and praying, praying and reading must be mingled as one. Praise the Lord for pray reading. Huh? And point B is that the incense is a sweet odor of Christ as our acceptance to God. When we experience Christ in such an inner way, he becomes our inner life, our inner supply, and our inner light. At the same time, we have a deep sense that the sweet odor of Christ is going up to God the preciousness of Christ becomes our acceptance to God. You know, here the, in our experience, this golden incense altar, everyone knows that's where prayer takes place. We pray at that golden incense altar. But it is more than just, oh, let's just pray. Here the prayer was mingled with the incense. In, what is incense? If you read the life study in Exodus, also there's a message on the incense, the constituents of 
incense, what make up the incense. The incense, simply speaking, is just a resurrected and ascended Christ. He is the sweet incense that should be mixed into our prayer. If you read Revelation chapter 8, you know, that is a, there is the, a record of the, at the uh, uh, opening up before the seven trumpet. You know, the, uh, the, the, uh, there was a scene of, uh, uh, a, of an altar where the prayer of, prayers of the saints were offered to God. Their prayers was likened to the censer. Censer, you know, in the, in the priest, they had to use a, like a, sen- is a, is a container. And then within which they put the incense and you burn. Our prayers are the censer. Our prayers are not the, are not the incense. Our prayers are the censer containing the incense. You have to add incense to your prayer and burn the incense to God. Not burning your prayer. Your prayers are just a container to receive the incense, which is Christ as your sweetness, as your preciousness. And when you burn and you pray, you are actually burning Christ as a sweet incense for your acceptance to God. And when, when God smells that incense so sweet to him, then he accepts us. He approves of us, and his, his will will be, his administration will be triggered. If you read chapter 8, as soon as the incense goes up, reaching the throne, then God executes his judgment. He has been waiting, waiting, waiting for the last 2,000 years for some, some, for this incense to arise to the throne, to release his administration, to carry out the final judgment on this earth. Today, I feel very much, we are, we, are, we are very close, if not there yet, in Revelation 8. At that golden incense altar. Who are the people who knows how to pray in this way? Many just pray, oh, uh, Lord, help, help us, or give me this, give me that. According to God, those are not prayers. Those are just your begging. Those are just your asking. Prayers are censers containing incense to be burnt up to God for our acceptance. Then, <clears throat> of course, you know, also experientially talk about burning incense. In, as we burn incense, we pray, we should read with the word. The word and the prayer should go together. This is very helpful. But I feel we need to know the intrinsic significance of, this, of the incense is, is Christ as our acceptance. It's not because your prayer means something. It's the incense added to your prayer that makes our prayer acceptable. So <clears throat> now this is, these are the three pieces of furniture in the holy place. Right? Now we are right at the entrance, at the entrance to the holy of holies. And don't forget, I mean, we, we need more time to talk about even the location of the incense altar in relation to the to the, to the Ark of the Covenant. In brief, actually, they are very close. When you reach the golden incense altar, you are practically maybe just a just few couple of feet away from the golden incense altar. I mean, for the, from the testimony, Ark of the Testimony. In fact, in the Old Testament, it mentioned about even this, the veil. It was separated just by a veil. That, what does it imply? And today, also in the New Testament, we are told that the veil has been riven. Now, that, that veil that was there in the Old Testament, now through Christ's death, now the veil is riven, is open. The way to the Holy of Holies now is wide open. Now, by the time you come to the incense, golden incense altar, practically you are right at the threshold to the Holy of Holies. You turn around, you are in the Holy of Holies. Before the ark, in the front of you is the golden incense altar. You turn to the back, it's the, it's the Ark of the Covenant. You know, this, uh, that's why Brother Lee talked about experientially. How do we enter the Holy of Holies? By our prayer. We pray ourselves into the Holy of Holies. You may start off in your mind when you pray. You're just in your soul, in yourself. But as you pray, exercising your spirit, 
you pray yourself into the Holy of Holies. But here now you are, you are about to enter into the Holy of Holies, where the ark was. Now, number five says, the priest experienced Christ as the ark. The ark is the very testimony of God, which is Christ himself. The priest had, had to bear the ark all the, at all times. As the priesthood, we must experience Christ as life, as light, and as our acceptance to God. And we must ex especially bear Christ as, the full, as God's full testimony. Christ is the living testimony of God, born by the priesthood. If we are really in the priesthood, we will bear Christ as God's living testimony. Last night I said, in the holy place, the priests still need to, you know, kind of uh, uh, refreshen up the bread, you know, lighten the lamp, trim the wicks, and so forth, and then uh, burn incense. When they entered into the holy of holies, standing before the ark, nothing to do. Nothing to do. No incense to burn. And the ark, as the center, as the cent most central piece of furnishing in the tabernacle, signifies God's testimony. In fact, because, you know, the, uh, the ark, you know, don't forget, inside the ark, there are some items there. Within the ark, there are three items. The first item is what? Is a, is a tablets of the law. <clears throat> the two tablets of the law were kept there. And the second item is Aaron's rod, the budding rod, is also kept there. And then the third item is a golden pot containing the hidden manna. In brief, let me tell you, all those three items correspond to the three items in the holy place. The golden pot with a hidden manna correspond to the bread, the showbread. The hidden, the, uh, the tablets of the law, that is God's testimony, God's word, ten words, correspond to the lampstand as God's testimony bearing the light. And Aaron's rod that budded correspond to the golden incense altar, the resurrected and ascended Christ for God's acceptance. God accepted Aaron, the rod, among the 12 rods, 12 tribes. Only his rod budded with almond, with resurrection. Now, these three items, which were in the holy place for us to, to, you know, to exercise over, now is in, concealed within Christ embodied within this ark of the testimony in a hidden way. In the, well, while, while we were in the, whole, in the holy place, we are still experiencing the, those things related to Christ. When you enter into the holy of holies before this ark of the testimony, all these items are now within Christ, in Christ. They are part of Christ. They are the very content of this arc of the testimony. God's design is too wonderful. When you enter the Holy of Holies, you are still experiencing these three things, but now in a much most in, intrinsic way. You are actually touching Christ himself directly. In the, in the holy place, you are still enjoying something of Christ, the life supply of Christ, the light of Christ, the sweetness of Christ. Now you enter the holy of holies, standing before the ark of the testimony, you are touching Christ himself. Now all those items are hidden within this Christ. And over this Christ, over this ark, are two cherubim. What are, what are cherubim? Cherubim are the you know, these are, these are the particular angels. They signify God's glory. These are two, two, two cherubim looking down on the lid of that, of that ark, which was sprinkled with the blood. So you are saved. Don't worry. You are, you, are, you know, in Old Testament, say when no one can see God and live. But praise the Lord as we enter into the Holy of Holies. Oh, the blood, the sprinkled blood is there. 
the blood that was sprinkled from the outer court now is brought to the Holy of Holies, sprinkled there. So when the cherubim looking on, he didn't look at you. He didn't see your failures. He sees the blood. And the blood covers, covers the ark, meeting all the demands by God's righteousness, holiness, and glory. And it's, it, it's in this place, I said, God, God says, I will meet with you. I will speak with you. What privilege is this? If someone were to invite you, uh, President Biden, I will come to my White House tomorrow. I will have, have breakfast with me. I will meet with you there, and I will speak with you there. I think you won't be able to sleep that night, right? <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to meet and, and, and talk with the President of the United States. But you know, every, this is every day. This is not once in your lifetime. This is every day. You can come to this place where God says, I will meet with you there. I will speak with you there. I have arranged everything. I have, I have made all the provision in the, on, in the outer court and in the holy place. And finally, you can, you can be brought to this place. I can directly speak with you and, 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 and meet with you. This is what a priest does. What did, what did the priest do? Oh, what grace, what privilege that God has laid this, arranged this, designed this layout for us to take. You know, here I cannot help but I'd like to read to you uh, Psalm 84. You know, recently uh, in one of the trainings, we also uh, mentioned this. This is so precious to me. I love this hymn, this psalm very much. The first five verses, let me read to you. How lovely are your tabernacles, O Jehovah of hosts. The tabernacles, here particularly referring to the, the, the sanctuary in the two, two parts. My soul longs, indeed even faints, for the courts of Jehovah. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. At your two altars, even the sparrows, sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. O Jehovah of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will yet be praising you, Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Here the psalmist mentioned, he was longing for the tabernacles. The tabernacles referring to the holy place and the holy of holies. The two sections. And then uh, he mentioned at your two altars. The two altars, one referred to the bronze altar in the outer court. And the other one is the golden incense altar in the, in the holy place. If you read the footnote under the two, the word two, footnote one, the bronze altar for the sacrifices and the golden altar of incense. The two altars signify the leading consummations of the work of the incarnated triune God, who is Christ as the embodiment of God for his increase. The mentioning of these two altars together in Exodus chapter 40, 5 to 6, indicates that they are closely related in our spiritual experience. At the bronze altar, a type of the cross of Christ, our problems before God are solved through the crucified Christ as our sacrifices. This qualifies us to enter into the tabernacle, a type of Christ as the incarnated and enterable triune God, and to con contact God at the incense altar. At the golden altar of incense, in front of the Holy of Holies, the resurrected Christ in his ascension is the incense for us to be accepted by God in peace. Through our prayer at the incense altar, we enter into the Holy of Holies, our spirit, where we experience Christ as the ark of the testimony with its contents. Through such an experience of Christ, we are incorporated into the tabernacle, the incarnated triune God to become a part of the corp 
of the corporate Christ as God's testimony for his manifestation. Through this experience, we, the ultimate result is what? It's an in, incorporation. We are incorporated with this process and consummated triune God. Here is not just sinners now approaching the Savior God. Now through this process, we sinners, now we, have be, we become sunized. We become glorified. We become incorporated with him to become the corporate Christ. This is the experience of the priest, brothers and sisters. This is the experience God has designed, God has ordained, and it's, it's a privilege to us. If you leave this alone, and to take this just merely as some information and knowledge, and I would say, shame to you. You know, such, you know, you got to take it to the White House, I take it to the, to the breakfast with the president. And you just put it aside on top on the shelf. Every day, not just once in a lifetime, every day, take this privilege to go through this journey. Follow God's design. Don't start from the inside, start from the outside. Start from the bronze altar. You go in to the second altar. Oh, the, the psalmist expressed, these two altars are so precious where the swallow can have their young, can build their nest. They can make their home here. This is where we dwell. We dwell between these two altars. We come to the God, to the altar of God, to God our exceeding joy, to begin our daily journey to experience Him in this priesthood. And we journey to for going forward into the holy place and holy of holies, to meet with God, to speak with God. What better life than this? Is there anything more worthwhile to live than this? Nas? You can, you, the Lord brought you from South Africa here to America, not to have more gold, more opportunities, but to here to meet God more, speak with God more. I hope all the saints, you see, the priesthood is not just a matter of duty, or oh, what I should do, this and that, this and that. Yes, there are things you need to do, but the most, most primary thing is for you to take this journey from the outer court, beginning from the bronze altar. Confess your sins, apply his blood, Lay your hands on these offerings, all these offerings, which are types of Christ. Then you go forward, enjoy the bread, dress the, and dress the lamb to be in the light and burn incense. Experience Christ as the most, the sweetest incense for your acceptance to God. Then you find yourself spontaneously in the Holy of Holies. Lately, I even, I was, you know, these, God designed these, this uh, tabernacle in three sections. We know there's an outer court, holy place, holy of holies. These three sections correspond to what? The three attributes of God. One in the outer court where God's righteousness is addressed. We, God's righteousness is being taken care of in the outer court with all the sacrifices. When you enter into the holy place, that's where God's sanctification, his holiness is experienced by the bread, by the light, by the incense. We are being sanctified. And then when you enter into the third section, the holy of holies, that is where God's glory is being experienced. You are just like 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, with unveiled face, we behold and reflect him as a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. That is the experience of the Holy of Holies, right? These three matters, God's righteousness, 
his sanctification and his glory were the three elements God placed before the fallen man after man fell. As the cherubim with the, with the flaming sword to guard the fallen man from approaching the tree of life. Remember? God's righteousness signifying God's righteous, uh, God's, the sword signifying God's righteousness, and the flame signifies God's uh, 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 holiness, and the cherubim signifies God's glory. Those three elements stood there to make demand on the fallen man to keep man from partaking of the tree of life. When Jesus Christ came, he fulfilled all of God's requirements in righteousness, in holiness, and in God's glory. He opened up the way. The gate has been opened for us to come to partake of the tree of life again. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.3, it is of God that we are in Christ Jesus, who it becomes wisdom to us from God, then what? Both righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What is redemption? That is the re redeeming of our body, the transfiguration of our body, the glorification of our body. The wisdom, Christ as the wisdom of God, is to become righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That is our glorification to us. Experientially, what is this? The tabernacle. How do you experience Christ as God's wisdom to be your righteousness, your sanctification, your glorification? Go through, go through the tabernacle. From the bronze altar to the golden altar to be ushered into the Holy of Holies. Dear saints, this is the highways to Zion. May God put in our heart the highways to Zion. Brother Lee says the highways to Zion is what? It's this journey from the outer court into the holy place, into the holy of holies. That is Zion. That holy of holies, that little place where God is, where the, test, where the ark of the testimony is, that is Zion. That is where God is. Our heart is, our heart is, full, is, is with this highway to this Zion every day. Get on this journey. Amen. Don't just drive off to go to have your cup of coffee. Don't just drive off to, have to go to work, rush to go to work. Get on your, this highway to Zion every day. Amen. Journey from altar to altar. Amen. Spend that 30 minutes, at least 20. Just to spend time enjoying all these aspects of Christ typified by the offerings. So rich. Dear saints, well, nothing spectacular will happen just because, oh, I, I've gone through this. I, I have not changed one bit yet. <laughs> take 10 years to go through this journey. Take 10 years. Every day, just take this journey. You'll be different. I can tell you. I can guarantee you. More of glory will be added to you. You'll be a priest experiencing what we talked about last night, being filled with God, saturated by God, permeated by God, flowing out with God. Don't be worrying about, oh, what I should do this, or I should do that. You know, tonight we'll talk about the, the, you know, the, the practice of the, 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 the priesthood of the gospel in relation to, the, you know, to contact people. Yes, there are, there are things we need to do. But that, I would still say, that is secondary. The primary thing you have to take care of is this journey, the highways to Zion. This is, this is how we get, become incorporated. We become a corporation with God. If you go every day speaking with God, listening to God, meeting with God, you become God. You know, just like Moses spending 40 days on the mountain with God, his face was so shining, he didn't even know. He came down to the mountain. Other people would say, whoa, this is too bright. I, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they didn't want to get close to Moses. Moses didn't know what happened to him. Moses didn't decide, I'm going to become God. But he just spent those 30, 40 days 
you know, speaking with God and meeting with God, and his face just shined. He had to put a veil upon himself so that he will not, you know, he was also afraid that this glory will fade away. But saints, there's a glory that will not fade away. A veil has been riven. You know, Paul says about, talk about his ministry. This is a, the ministry that the New Testament ministry is what? It's a ministry of righteousness. It's a ministry of the Spirit. That Spirit is the one who sanctifies us. This is also the ministry unto glory. Right? This is the ministry that will usher God's people in, from the outer court all the way into the Holy of Holies to incorporate us with the triune God, to make us and God, God and man, man and God, an incorporation. We become the corporate Christ. Zion is here. The new Jerusalem is here. Right? This is too, too wonderful. I hope, dear saints, we will not just take this merely as some knowledge. Oh, this is wonderful, good to hear. What's new next? No, nothing new next. This is the newest. This is the newest. But you have to enter into it. Let me just quickly finish. Um, I read five, right? Yeah, I will come to uh, Roman numeral six. The priest experienced Christ as the tabernacle. The priesthood must also take care of the tabernacle, which typifies the enlarged Christ as the dwelling place of God. After we, as the priesthood, richly experience Christ, we must take care of the whole church, the whole body of Christ. The church is simply the enlargement of Christ. B, in Numbers 4, the priests take care of the tabernacle, the boards, the coverings, and all the utensils within the tabernacle. One, the experiences of Christ as the offerings, as the inner life, as the inner light, as the inner acceptance, and as the testimony of God are all for the church. The more we experience Christ as the reality of all these items, the more we, we, we will be for the body of Christ. These experiences, brothers and sisters, are not for individuals to make someone spiritual giants. All these are experiences related to the priesthood for the caring for the tabernacle. These are not for your, to become, just to uh, make yourself a spiritual uh, fixture somewhere, but to be a part of the building work of God on the earth, which is signified by the building of the tabernacle. As the priesthood of God experiencing Christ as everything, we must take care of the church so that the body of Christ may become God's dwelling place on the earth. The church life comes out of our experience of Christ as the inner life. And last point, we must ask the Lord to bring us into all these experiences and make them real to us. May it be so that all these experiences may be real to us. I don't want to set your hope high to say, well, if I do this, everything will be different, everything will be, uh, will be glorious tomorrow. Well, you will still look the same. You will still uh, you know, speak the same. But I can guarantee you, every day, a little bit more journeying into God. There's a lot of deeper things that you have never explored. Right? You, have even got, you have gone through even all those items in the holy place. But all the hidden things in the, within the ark, you have yet to realize, right? There's no depth. There's no, I mean, there is no, no bottom to spiritual experiences. It's fathomless. Yeah, you have bread of life. Amen. Christ is my bread. I eat Christ. Yes. But how about the hidden manna? Right? Spiritual experience. Don't be satisfied with the superficial uh, thing. Oh, I got it. I know Christ is my bread, Christ is my light, Christ is my incense. You have to, there are, there, there's the, the, uh, uh, the superficial level, but there's a, a deeper level. And you, you can spend your whole life just getting into this matter of Christ as your food, 
as your life supply. It's fathomless. So don't be, don't be shallowly satisfied, contented with just some, you know, your understanding. We need really the Lord's grace and mercy that we will not be easily content and become complacent in our attitude. In these last days, God must gain the priesthood. Amen. Only the priesthood can be the kingship who will bring in his kingdom to the earth. That's why these matters, saints, don't take it lightly. Don't take it just another good message from the conference. I believe the Lord has something very crucial in speaking to us through these messages. Okay, I stop here. I'll transfer back to the brothers for the next. We have some time now for the saints to respond and overflow, but let's please keep our speaking to one minute or less, and be sure to speak loudly, clearly, with an exercise spirit that we all can hear. Hallelujah. Last night I was wondering what uh, ministering to the Lord was, and I just had to wait for this message. Because really it's just entering into God. It's entering into the tabernacle and being mingled.